Hey everybody, um, thanks for joining in today on this webinar. Uh, my name is Bahan, as Fikra introduced me. I'm a student in the School of Theology and Philosophy and Music, uh, studying the ethical issues of social media's attention economy business model. So basically going to talk about um, the lit review that I've done in the first year uh, of this PhD. Let me just get this presentation going here. Uh, one second. Sorry about this. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so the topic, the title of it is Know Thy Data, The Ethical Issues uh, of Social Media Companies uh, Attention Economy Business Model. Um, if you don't know what the attention economy business model is, this is kind of a brief description of it. Um, so... The business model relies on the data of users, uh, which is extracted from attention, which is sold to third parties and advertisers for profit. This is the business model of most large social media companies like Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, any large scale platforms that are essentially free. Um, as they say in documentaries like The Social Dilemma, if the product is free, uh, then you are the uh you are how they're profiting essentially because it's the advertisers are the real customers, not the people that are getting the platform for free. So to introduce this project, um, there's a lot of material published in the public sphere linking the ethical issues of social media to the attention economy business model. However, thus far, no systematic literature review has been done on the topic. Um, this is part of a larger project in order to examine the ethical issues of social media that have been reported. It's obviously been 10 years since social media really uh, took over in the early 2010s and became platforms with billions of users. And so a lot of the ethical issues have just emerged. They've become, they've kind of come to public consciousness. And so now many different types of fields are kind of grappling with uh, what's happened and trying to get a sense of the whole uh, vastness of the issues is really what this project has been about. So in this, we're going to look at um, some of the research objectives that we had um, when we were starting the project, which was defining what social media is, uh, mapping out the ethical issues that are reported within the literature and the ethical solutions that have been proposed. Um, I also looked at ethical theories that they were applying, but for the sake of time, we're going to mainly focus on the ethical issues and the solutions that have been proposed uh, in the literature. So uh, the ethical issues identified. Um, I broadly broke the ethical issues, uh, which there are 13 ethical issues in total that we're going to go through, uh, into these four clusters. Um, these clusters of autonomy, unfair market practice, uh, democracy and the public sphere, and platform governance. So these clusters are ethical issues issues that have in common the same kind of normative violation. So in the case of autonomy, all these ethical issues are thought to have in common that they violate users' individual autonomy. Um, and I'll explain what these are as we kind of go through them and try to get a sense of you know, what the field is. So the ethical issues within autonomy are uh, addiction, they are uh, distraction, and uh, manipulation. So Oh, sorry, that's gone off. Uh, there. Let me see this. Oh, sorry about that. Um, apologies about that. Yeah. So addiction generally is linked to addictive design techniques that companies use in order to uh, persuade people to use technologies. You've probably heard of some of these before. Things like uh, infinite scrolls, where when you open, say, Instagram, and you swipe down in order to generate new content, it will load for a second to create an anticipatory reward, and then you get a kind of infinite amount of content. And um, that was designed in order to prevent stopping friction, which is whereby people would hit the end of a page, and then they might think, okay, well, I'll do something else. And a lot of platforms like TikTok have evolved in order to take advantage of these uh, human psychological weaknesses. Um, distraction, again, kind of a lower order issue than full-blown addiction, but also a problem of, say, chronic notifications, uh, getting messages frequently and 
um, being overwhelmed by digital notifications and uh, kind of being on the hook a lot of the time. Um, manipulation is similarly a, a broad category in this in terms of unconsciously influencing people. Um, the difference between persuasion and manipulation is that manipulation happens unconsciously for people. So if a person is being uh, manipulated by a technology, it's working on a subconscious level. And this even happens to me. It's, it was something I was talking about in a podcast recently, which is that even though I spend all this time studying this stuff, as soon as I open up Instagram, uh, I can still get just as much stuck in a, a loop as anybody else because it's working on such a subconscious level that even if you have conscious understanding of what they're doing, it's still very difficult to resist uh, these manipulative design techniques. Um, so that's the issue of autonomy, uh, which is affecting individual freedom, free will. Um, and we're going to come back around to these as well as we go. So unfair market practice. These are kind of economic uh, problems that are linked to the attention market and the attention market, which we briefly discussed in the opening is a, a zero price market. So there's no uh, charge for it upfront for the customer, unless you're using a premium service, but the real uh, way that the companies make their money is from the resale of attention to advertisers. And so this causes certain problems. Uh, the main ones in the literature are attentional monopolies um, because of network effects. People tend to cling to platforms that a lot of their friends are on. If you have tons of social media sites with just a couple of people on them, they're much less appealing. And um, because of the, net, the network effects, the platforms become more valuable the more people that they have. And um, that's why you end up with these kind of oligopolies or large companies uh, like Facebook that would have a monopoly within their kind of sphere and then through mergers and takeovers can acquire more of the field like their acquiring of Instagram and WhatsApp, um, which leads then to a concentration of power on these platforms. Uh, the second is excessive advertising. Um, again, because the companies profit only from advertisements, um, the incentive is to build the platforms to be more and more engaging for people. Uh, to keep them looking at ads longer in order to generate more revenue. Um, and this can lead to an environment that's very cluttered. And of course, that it, people talk about the attentional ecology, uh, they talk about attentional pollution and being subconsciously influenced by ads a lot of the time. And um, the third one is privacy and behavioral data collection. Obviously, the theme of today's thought, talk is uh, know thy data, which is a very key point that your data they talk about data shadows or data personas um in the literature which is that the history of your attentional patterns online is very useful for predicting your behavior and um, there's up to 96 data points that uh, facebook can collect just from what you're looking at not even based on what you like or what you're messaging to people so um that attentional history which leaves behind a data is a very key thing for hacking into people's behavior. This is uh, Susanna Zuboff's argument in her 2019 book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism, which is that the business model of these companies are recording the data and then using that to modify people's behavior. Um, and so that's what's actually being sold is, is access to people's um, behavioral patterns in order to generate profit from it. So privacy there is very key, not just in terms of uh, shielding, say, sensitive information, but also in terms of protecting your free will um, from subconscious manipulations. So the third section is democracy in the public sphere. This one is quite popular. Uh, the Digital Services Act has been addressing a lot of it. You've probably seen some of it online in terms of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, misinformation obviously is unintentionally spreading information that's false. Disinformation is intentionally spreading false information, um, both of which have increased massively online and are being affected a lot by generative AI, uh, which has allowed for the creation of content more easily, essentially, that could be uh, misleading. And then uh, content moderation and free speech. This is obviously another massive issue in terms of um, the issues of companies' content moderation um, policies limiting people's right to freedom of expression. Um, 
And this includes issues such as defining between illegal content or harmful content, hate speech, um, content that's deemed offensive or um, the ways that these companies might screen out certain types of arguments uh, online based on their particular policies. Um, so again, a very important uh, issue at the moment. Polarization is quite controversial in the literature in terms of whether or not social media directly fuels polarization. It is thought to be one of the causes of polarization, but in itself, not uh, not the sole cause of polarization. But there are certain divisive um, platform uh, tactics that do lead to uh, what seems to be fractionization, the worth of Ratcha et al. and uh, Brady et al. on outgroup animosity, um, which implicates essentially social media's content regulation or content recommendation algorithms uh, in promoting outgroup animosity, um, high arousal emotions, and also incentivizes things like misinformation and disinformation. Um, and then finally, the topic of cybercrime and terrorism, not entirely linked uh, to the business model, but also is thought to encourage, uh, is thought to be encouraged through what's called spectacularization, which is that through social media's uh, promotion of attention seeking, there can be affinities between that and certain terrorist acts like mass shootings that might be streamed. Um, and so there is an indirect connection to the business model uh, that promotes attention maximization. And the final section is platform governance. So the topics in platform governance are questions about the normative issues around the governance of platforms. Um, for most of the 21st century, platforms have been left for self-regulation, whereby they were in charge of uh, regulating themselves their business practices, their trade-offs were between their business profits and their own uh, limitations imposed. It's largely thought at this point that self-regulation has failed um, due to the fact that the company's incentives to uh, pursue people's attention in ways that are unethical are much stronger than their ability uh, to regulate themselves. So what has we've seen in the regulatory space has been a movement to external governance, uh, which is regulations uh, from generally governments, things like the EU. Um, the American system is quite different. And then the third uh, regulatory model is the Chinese uh, authoritarian model, which has been um, a much more top down regulatory. But the all, most countries seem to be moving towards a sense that these companies do need to be regulated on the national level, although there's obviously difficulties there because uh, they are international companies as well. Um, so that that is a space that's kind of emerging. And then the third one is third party governance, which would be things like third party policy oversight panels, um, ethical committees, uh, standards of, say, journalistic uh, integrity. And these can play a sort of intermediate role between national uh, government and the companies themselves. Um, so these are some of the problems that are happening with um, platform governance. So here you can see the 13 ethical issues um, and these four kind of hierarchy of, of clusters. Um, if any of you are students of ethics or doing ethics and new technologies, there is going to be a lot of business, obviously, in this area because... Many of these problems are just coming to the forefront and remain unsolved as of yet. Um, so we're really only getting a handle on on what the consequences of these large scale information technologies have been. Um, and so now that we've mapped out that slightly terrifying problem space, let's look at some of the solutions that are reported uh, in the literature. Uh, with regard to individual autonomy, the main um, recommendation for addictive design is changing design interventions, adding things like stopping cues whereby people will be reminded of how long they've used the technology for, um, options for people to customize their own news feeds if they want to use a chronological news feed rather than one that's personalized by algorithm. Uh, giving people more control over their own design and taking it out of the hands of the company that are obviously so incentivized um, to try and keep people engaging longer. And 
this comes down to, again, the business model, which is in the literature is recommended that even if you changed a lot of the design with external governance, if you don't change the business model, it won't change the incentives at the bottom of the platform. So there'll always be a sense of uh, tug or war between the uh, companies and the regulations until the business model is actually dealt with. Um, in terms of distraction, it's thought that the the issues of distraction aren't ever really going to be cured by uh, third party regulation. I mean, if the internet is fun and enjoyable, you're always going to be in danger of spending too much time on it and not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. So some of the recommendations in the literature are educational campaigns um, helping people with attentional control and also awareness of, say, the affordances in the digital environment that can lead you to spend too much time there, basically. Um, another example of that as well is a, a human right to freedom of attention, uh, which would be a, a type of deontic uh, intervention, something like the right to freedom of thought or conscience, which would mean that companies, the human right would apply to people in these countries, and then the companies would have a responsibility in order to protect people's attention. Um, it's thought that this would be an important step in the 21st century, something like the right to be forgotten. Um, as Tristan Harris talks about in uh, The Social Dilemma, we didn't need a right to be forgotten until technology could remember people forever. Similarly, we don't need a right to freedom of attention until our attention can be captured and kept by attention-optimized technology. So, um that's another kind of step forward in terms of protecting people's uh, cognitive faculties, really, from um, very powerful technologies. Um, and finally, then, in terms of manipulation, uh, all of the above apply, really, to manipulation, but also uh, data regulation. Surprisingly, the GDPR, uh, these are all very important tools uh, to protect people's data because what is used, the data is what's used for personalization. So if companies have limited access to your data, it's much harder for them to target precision content advertisements to you. Um, so an important part of protecting people from manipulation is protecting their data. And then also consumer education in terms of what these platforms do, how they are operating and their usual kind of tricks for capturing uh, and manipulating people's attention unconsciously. Um, unfair market practice. Um, in terms of attentional monopolies, the main recommendations are breakups, um, which would be taking companies like uh, Facebook and separating WhatsApp and Instagram, not allowing one company to buy up smaller companies that are going to compete with them. Uh, creating competition in the social media market means there's a better chance of companies competing on safety and also on consumers having the option to choose different platforms. So they're not just funneled into one very manipulative platform. So for instance, if people find out one platform is very manipulative, um, they can then transition off to another one. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, the network effects make that very difficult um, and it's really limited. It. And we've seen like those mergers uh, with WhatsApp and Instagram that were very highly criticized afterwards because it gave Facebook uh, a majority uh, in the social media market. Um, so in terms of, uh, yes, excessive advertising, um, treating companies as information fiduciaries, similarly to say how doctors have a fiduciary duty to uh, their patients, uh, social media companies, information companies have a lot of information on their users. And if a person had a similar amount of information on you, you would expect it to be confidential. I mean, they easily have as much information as your healthcare provider. So the idea that they don't have the corresponding responsibilities um, to take care of that information like a, a healthcare provider would for healthcare information is a massive blind spot at the moment that that is uh, requiring more regulation. Um, similarly, with the behavioral data collection, again, it's more control over data for people and limiting 
the data collection. Um, it really is a, a, a strand running through this entire argument how important uh, your data is online. And we see with a lot of Web3 models, uh, decentralized social networks, the emphasis that they put on um, people owning their own data. Um, it's a lot of the impetus behind developing social graphs, which would allow people to have an interoperable social media environment whereby they you have your own data and you can go to these different platform or different interoperable platforms um, without them owning your data, which is obviously the issue we have with big centralized companies. Um, so democracy in the public square, in terms of uh, misinformation and disinformation with the business model, the main thing is content ranking transparency. Um, one Facebook employee uh, made the point that if they changed the content ranking algorithms on Facebook. They estimated that they could remove up to 50% of misinformation. Uh, it's also connected with disinformation because just because so, uh, if a disinformation campaign goes viral, um, the algorithms will still promote it, even though it's untrue. We see that with a lot of images um, that are generated. One that got me was uh, an image of the Pope wearing some sort of... Uh, fancy um, rapper style jacket that went viral everywhere, but that was promoted by the content ranking algorithms, even though it was untrue because they're optimized for attention rather than something like reliability. Um, and so having access to content ranking algorithms for governments, for researchers, is very important to actually understanding what they're doing and what the influences are on democracy of these content ranking algorithms. Um, which kind of leads into this second point, which is um, content traffic regulation. In, in terms of content moderation and free speech, at the moment, the regulations are very focused on illegal content, uh, specifying what types of content people can post and what types that they can't. But what this ignores is the role of the architecture of the platforms in promoting certain types of content over others, um, what are called game reasons in the literature. Uh, people post on social media and then you get likes, you get shares, and based on how many likes and shares you get, the content is promoted to more people. So the structure of the platform and the content ranking algorithms incentivize certain types of content. And so there's massive questions about what type of content should be incentivized in democracies. Um, we've obviously seen a lot of destabilizing content being recommended, but in terms of a positive rewiring of the landscape of social media, what could better platform architecture look like in order to promote, say, democratic discourse, to promote individual agency, um, well-reasoned debate. Um, a lot of these things, I think, are going to have to be thought about ultimately um, it to deal with the problems of the landscape. And then polarization, similarly, uh, further research and regulation. Uh, Cybercrime and terrorism is not directly linked to the business model, but some of the recommendations are stress testing um, platforms to see are there affinities between, say, live streaming of violent acts and the platform, and then manual editing in real time. So if somebody is live streaming a, a violent crime, could you cut them off? Can you stop that from happening uh, on the platform, which a lot of platforms have had to kind of deal with after the fact, unfortunately, when they've been used um, for such a to promote really terrible things. So um, that's definitely the way of uh, dealing with cybercrime is going to be that involvement in the moment. Um, and platform governance. So self-regulation largely failed. Um, it, it seems to be the conclusion of, of much of the regulatory space that there needs to be at least national regulation on these companies. And... A lot of that in the literature is pointing towards a global bill of digital human rights. Um, you see even with AI and with a lot of the uh, complexity around the um, internet now with generative AI, with interactive AI, where people can create large amounts of content. Um, Taylor Swift, which, who was recently victimized by um, with AI doctored photos and questions of what human rights are in this digital world? I mean, do you have rights to your own image, to your own voice, um, to your attentional data? There seems to be a real need for an overarching um, constitution 
for individuals in the digital world now, which has been um, very complex and is certainly um, affecting all areas of individual life and democracy. So that is something that's highly uh, considered in the literature. Um, and then in terms of third party oversight, uh, having social media councils similar to how they have press councils that examine journalistic practices, enforce um, ethos and a sense of uh, professional standards and norms, which is uh, sorely missing from, from the platform environment. So in summary, you can see this slightly terrifying table um, of recommendations for each of these 13 issues. And again, you can see the complexity and why it's been so slow really to um, develop a response to the social media landscape because so many of the problems are still emerging and are happening statistically across very large populations. So I've been very hard to measure. And even during this literature review, because it's spread across um, diverse literatures like law, like economics, like politics, like psychology, like medicine, um, you really, it, it's a massively interdisciplinary subject, uh, the ethics of social media. And so it requires a lot of cooperation uh, across disciplines. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, um, every new technology leads to new responsibilities. Um, a lot of the current innovation has been driving the creation of new technologies, but not really dealing with the consequences of said technologies. Um, the kind of proverbial uh, move fast and break things attitude of Silicon Valley. Um, I think social media being the first public facing large scale encounter with AI is a canary in the coal mine really for future AI problems. Um, generative AI, which I mentioned as well as a good example of that. Um, how that was used in social media in order to create uh, a lot of these reinforcement um schedules that encourage people to overuse that have been bad for democracy and um, that have caused attentional downgrading um, will probably be sped up by generative AI and interactive AI to make, you know, more addictive content, uh, chatbots and AI influencers that can tailor themselves uh, personalized to people that are using the platforms. And so the, I think if social media is anything uh, to go by, we're going to have a very hard time with these other technologies because we haven't really dealt with the problems of the first wave uh, yet. So I do see social media as the kind of first um, first encounter with this technology and that we haven't really gone a long way to dealing with it, um, unfortunately. So 10 years on, this is kind of where the field is at of social media. Um, I think there are some very exciting projects. Uh, the Center for Humane Technology are fantastic. Uh, Frank McCourt's Project Liberty. Um, but also we're a long way off. So it's a, it's an exciting field for uh, younger people to get into or people that might be involved in ethics um, in general. And it's certainly one, I think, that's going to have a lot more... Um, it's going to need a lot more work really before, before it's dealt with. So thank you very much um, for your time and attention. And if anybody has any questions, uh, I'll take them now.